Welcome to Vene Naras, where we talk about all things Latin and writing and books. I'm Rachel Cutting, and I live on a mountain where it's raining, which means my internet is probably super speedy. But it's fun to watch. Um, <laughs> I, know. I am Ariane Belzer Carroll, and I don't live on a mountain, and my internet is slightly faster. Um, but I did just hike up a mountain, so I feel like that's something. Um, we haven't we haven't talked about what we're reading lately. Rachel, are you reading anything interesting on your on your mountain with no internet? On my mountain with no internet, nothing has internet. Um, I had just finished reading uh, the world that we knew, which I very much enjoyed. Um, I didn't start off enjoying it, and then it kept like, but I was like interested enough, and then it kept building until it was addressing these big questions about what it means to be alive what it means to love and to be human um, against this backdrop of World War II and <laughs> resistance fighters. Um, and so by the end of it, I was like super engaged in the story. So yeah, I just I finished like that book and really enjoyed it. What about I, you? What are you reading? I, something a lot shorter. Um, I just finished reading a book called Griffin and Sabine, um, which was so mesmerizing that I immediately made Ben read it. Um, because I couldn't get it out of my brain. It's, it includes manipulatives. Um, there are letters that you can take out and read. Um, the plot is wildly unclear. You have no idea who any of the characters are. It's held back intentionally, and then it ends on a wild cliffhanger, and you're left thinking, what are the characters and what just happened? Um, and I think, I mean, I hate it because I always want to know what happened, but I think there's a lot to be said for leaving some stuff out because it's apparently wicked engaging. Um, as long as it's or not apparently taking something so, out yourself. Manipulatives are super fun. I, uh, I wish we could do it. I feel like <laughs> I would lose that. <laughs> um, anyway, so we have we have our own story today. Uh, yes, and what is that story? We um, we're going to talk about research tips. We've heard from a couple of people that they'd like to write something, but they're not sure where to start looking, either in terms of um, finding topics that haven't been done already or making sure that they are. Um, being culturally inclusive or finding something, uh, a voice that hasn't been spoken for yet, um, or just researching elements of a novella that they've never had to know about before. Boats come to mind, personally. <laughs> for me, it's how you go about freeing a slave. It's not something I knew a lot about. Yep, also Phoenician wedding practices. Um, and some of this takes some very creative researching. Um, and how you research will depend heavily on what you're writing, which we're going to address separately today. Um, I vividly recall having to find a novel set in ancient Phoenicia as a starting point and then having to reach out to that author to find his sources because I couldn't find anything. Um, community, actually, this is a plug for community. Um, reach out to your community. Yay, community. And ask if they've got sources. Um, Anyway, I want to split this up into um, how we research when we are telling um, mythological stories versus when we are writing historical fiction. Do you want to start with myth? That's sort of your purview. <laughs> yes. So I've written several myth-based stories, and for those, I use two big resources. And one of them is going to be painful for me to admit. So as a former English teacher, Using Wikipedia always felt a little bit like a dirty secret I can't confess to for posterity's sake. <laughs> I once looked up Jane Austen in Wikipedia, and the Wikipedia article proudly stated that she was an author of burlesque fiction. She's not. She's not. Yeah. <laughs> Which is just no. Um, but at the same time, it's pretty useful. So I like to use Wikipedia to get like a gist when I'm trying to tease out a topic idea, especially with myth. I'll read about the characters um, in the myth or in the story. And then it has all of those handy sources at the bottom of the page. But at the same time, I wouldn't use it for every fact in the article, like being an author of burlesque fiction. So to scale back or step back to um, myth, I want to state that even though I write all of these myth stories, I think it's really important for me to say I am not a myth expert. Um, I don't teach myth. I, I mean, I do, but I don't. Um, I 
I could not name all 12 labors of Hercules. And I had never heard of uh, Malthea before. I read it in a Kirtana question. And my response as like a first or second year teacher was, who would know this? Um, <laughs> I was convinced no one would know it. Um, so I'm not a myth person. Person, but I can still write stories about myth. And one of my favorite places to go is uh, Theoi um, when I'm writing a myth story because it gives me an overview, tells me how people are related. It actually also pulls out like snippets of stories and like where that information comes from. So I find it incredibly helpful. I also love that it tells you myth variants mm -hmm. because sometimes I like the variants way way more than the most popular myth. And in fact, when I was reading about Pegasus um, and Bellerophon, I found some really fun variants in the story when I was still in my brainstorming and pre-writing stages that I looked at and was like, this is perfect for this theme that I'm trying to play with. And so I decided to use some variant versions for that reason. Mm -hmm. I'll often read stories in translation or summaries of that story. So I had read some of Apuleius's Kubra Psuche in Latin before when I was an undergraduate, and I read more of it when I was adapting it. I read its entirety in English. I skimmed some extra stretches in Latin to try to pull out phrases, and then I just read other bits of it more carefully because I was interested in that chunk. When I was reading Medea, <laughs> many of the sources are in Greek. Uh, I don't know Greek, <laughs> so I read a lot of her summaries in translation or just, um, yeah, I mostly read summaries from Medea which I think is fine. Um, though I did also look at the Heroides version, which was fun. So yeah, I look at a variety of sources when I'm doing myth. Um, so what you're saying is like, you like to get an overview and then you use the sources at the, the bottom of the Wikipedia page to sort of direct you to spaces where you might find versions and variants that you didn't expect. Um, and that Theoi can also tell you what other authors have written about those things um, so that you have, you have roads that you can follow. Yes. Sweet. I do. Do you, do you find that you spend more time reading primary or secondary sources? And like, what do you, what do you get out of those? Well, I'm going to say it depends on what I'm writing. So I usually read secondary sources because it's more concise and it draws on multiple primary sources for me already. Um, I do the read and mix of materials. So Sometimes with myth, references are really small on only parts of other stories. So in my short story, Carries at Serenes, I came across like a chunk that referenced the metamorphoses. So I went back and looked at that really tiny chunk on the metamorphoses to see what he said about the sirens. And so I found that information when I was looking at a secondary source. I, I would not have read I think that's really important what you're mentioning, that like when you find chunks that are referred to in your secondary sources to go back and read those things and see how those are different or, or what information you get from those. I think that's hugely important. Yeah, so, and when I was it. writing, no, that's okay. Um, it's just, yeah, it's a small chunk. I would have never found it. Um, and I just saw like a reference in the metamorphoses, these lines, so I went to them. Um, I did suffer through reading a very good chunk of Julius Caesar in translation because he's the only person really to talk about this battle that was important to one of my stories. So Caesar's yeah. better in Latin. And myths aside, I know that you don't write as many myth-based stories as I do and that you know a lot about Roman boats. So I want you to talk now about how you research when you're writing one of your historical novellas. Boats. Um, so <laughs> I do. I mostly write history. Um, so you're right. My source searches look um, different than yours, but I still really, really want to read a wealth of primary source material. And I always start in the primary source material. Not true. I usually start in Wikipedia, but after Wikipedia. Um, what I go looking for is primary source material. I can usually think of one or two authors that write on a topic. Um, I know that Virgil wrote about Dido, for example. Uh, but there are lot, right, um, but there are a lot of texts and excerpts and so forth out there that I wouldn't have known about, and that I think a lot of us don't know about. 
um, our classical education tends to be fairly regimented. Um, I did not know who Justin was, um, but his story of Dido is the way more agreed upon one than Virgil's story, which is a wild outlier. Um, so Wikipedia gave me Justin's name and then I need to hunt down that text. Google is your friend. Um, you wanna be as specific as humanly possible. It turns out typing in Justin doesn't get you a whole lot of anywhere. <laughs> Um, Justin's epitome of trogus will get you further. Um, but the, I'm so sorry about my Italian, Biblioteca, Biblioteca Digitale di Testi Latini Tardio, An, Tardo Antichi, um, if you're looking for later sources, I think it's like third or fourth century on, uh, maybe a little earlier, uh, Google Books, there's a lot of great stuff on Google Books that you can find in almost complete text, you just have to get used to the funky S's. Um, archive.org has a lot of complete texts. Um, Locus Curtius often does things in both English and Latin and English and Greek if, if that's your jam and what you're working with. Um, and you'll find a wealth of texts in those places, including things that it wouldn't have occurred to you to go find. Um, also on the Latin library, if you look at the drop down box, not just look at the things on the screen, you'll find a lot of texts that you didn't think were there. Um, and that can be super useful as well. Um, I also use the PHI. You'll hear some people call it the fee. Um, we'll talk about the, the PHI, I'm sure, at a different time. Um, but it is a, it's a concordance, among other things. So you can search within authors and you can search just words. So um, this morning, I was trying to find texts about Africa, which is a really broad topic. <laughs> um, so I used the concordance to search for texts that included the word Africa and Africanus and Afers, or Afer and Afri and so forth. Um, but Fordham's Internet History Source Book also has a lot of original texts. Um, and I use all of those things um, to go hunting down those texts. Right. So a lot of very different research than reading about gods. Well, right. And I think that, so, that myth is by nature a little bit narrower because you have the story, right? And then you just have variants on the story. Um, when you're retelling a historical and historical idea, there's a lot of branches that you have to end up following. Um, and so your research is just going to look different. Right. So speaking of, what uses do you find for primary versus secondary sources in your research? That's a good question. Um, primary sources I find are really great for getting to know a situation, um, getting to know a character, um, because they tend to be heavy perspective. Um, so you can sort of climb into them. Uh, for finding language that you want to use when you're using them in the original. Um, Dux femina facti comes to mind. Um, and I like to, to pick out that language uh, for reasons we've talked about before. For scene imagery, um, there's some gorgeous descriptions of things um, that are fun to steal. Uh, first person perspective and also corroborating information that I read in a secondary source. Um, very frequently, secondary sources will claim things and you'll wanna go back to the original source uh, and see if that is in fact what it said. Uh, primary texts I also find really useful for subtext. Think about reading a summary of Daphne and Apollo versus reading Ovid's version of Daphne and Apollo. You're gonna get a wildly different story. Um, and so the subtext is super useful. Um, I always try to establish my footing by starting in primary sources, um, but in general when researching, I find uh, consistent use for secondary sources for overview, um, for comparison, for context, and like you said, um, for introduction to other authors and texts, um, and also for broader insight into what my primary sources are discussing, right? Like Ovid didn't live 200 years after Ovid was alive. So, <laughs> I mean, he didn't. And so sometimes secondary sources are really useful um, for providing an overview and comparison and other ideas and later research and so forth um, that, that a primary I text just can't provide. I just love that, that idea of finding something in a secondary source that you didn't know existed, which is something that happened to me in Medea when there was this whole reference to this thing that I had never heard of before and I thought it was really cool, so I spent a lot of time on that. And it can send you right back to the primary texts. <laughs> Uh, yes, <laughs> yes it does. <laughs> um, secondary sources also really help me establish timelines. Um, it's hard to do that with primary sources and also answering specific questions. Um, boats, a lot of secondary source <laughs> research went into boats. Um, you can topic search through Goodreads 
um, what you do is you open Goodreads and then you type in Dido and you see what books on Dido come up and then you decide which ones are legit and which ones are fun novels that would be fun to read one day. Um, and that is how I found a work called Reading Dido, which is pretty cool. Um, I use the bibliographies and footnotes of other books. Um, JSTOR. Oh, yeah. Yep. JSTOR is super yes. useful. Um, I had to, to research Ethiopians in Rome. You can sign up for a free account on JSTOR, even if you're not associated with an academic institution that has a subscription. Um, and they give you like a stupid amount of articles. per. I have yet to hit my limit um, of articles per month. So JSTOR is your friend. Um, Google lines from the Latin that you're reading that can lead to secondary sources um, on the same topic and also other primary sources that quote um, the same thing. And many of those are gonna be partially or fully online for you. Um, and sometimes they will send you to podcasts and web series. Um, the Historia Key Willis comes to mind that's super useful. Um, and the information therein can be both immediately applicable and potentially the, the origin for, for specific search terms that you can use. I've been talking a lot. Rachel, do your research methods differ um, when you're researching for a plot that you invented because you've done both of those? Yes, they do. So for Domini Secretum, I definitely still started with Wikipedia. So that was a place that I started. I also found myself Googling things. That's primarily what I did. So I Googled Roman slave names and came across websites. I Googled Saturnalia. I Googled Roman mines and just Roman slaves in general. And I would finesse my search using tricks like quotation marks, because if you Google Roman or Latin, like. You get the same thing that happens when you Google Justin. <laughs> yes, pretty much. Um, <laughs> yeah. So I also would follow some of the footnotes to other sources um, and I would research the major questions. And sometimes these came up like really early in the brainstorming process. So I knew from the beginning that a Roman mind was going to be an important plot point. And then during the brainstorming process, I also asked myself questions mm -hmm. like, what other cultural points about slavery can I bring in? And then I recalled that there were um, essentially dog collars that mm -hmm. some slaves were when they were fugitive slaves um, and had been brought back to their um, masters. Mm -hmm. And so I decided that that would be an important cultural point to include from and a story from the perspective of slaves. So I spent a lot of time <laughs> reading about those, um, <laughs> quite a bit actually. So. Other times I would be like starting to outline and I would have this like frantic like thought bubble occur to me like oh my gosh do Romans even free teenagers how does that work and then you find yourself googling all sorts of things about um, the age at which <laughs> Roman slaves can be freed and I don't remember how I found that aside I'm sure I was frantically googling because that was important also. Um, I, mean, I think the corollary to that is Google is good, but find a reputable source. Yeah, and I, I'm pretty sure I found it in a Google book um, that talked about, because it talked about a law. There was a law, um, I think it was the Lex Ilia, um, that was passed in 4 CE, which I do remember. Um, <laughs> so, because that affected when I could date my book. Mm -hmm. um, because there was a law passed that said that Romans, um, they, they limited the age at which you could free a slave to 30, like you couldn't be freed before then, um, after they passed that law. And that was not a thing that I knew anything about, and I found it with the Google search. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, I think you bring up a really important point, which is that part of brainstorming is asking the kinds of questions that you're going to need to be able to answer, and that can give you um, an idea of where you want to start. Um, with your research. And sometimes those questions just come up um, as you go. Um, I find that um, <laughs> whether I'm inventing the story or um, retelling something that's already known, the process isn't hugely different for me. It just tends to be down to the kinds of questions that I'm asking and the kinds of sources uh, that I end up with can be pretty different. Um, when I've invented my own story, my questions tend to be far more specific um, 
and I will use secondary sources more heavily, um, although certainly not exclusively. Um, and I need to have a fairly clear idea of those plot points for, for the reasons that we were just talking about. So I know what I need to learn about. Um, I try to think in really rich detail about settings and events so that I can start asking those questions. For Lucia Heros, I knew I was gonna contrast how uh, Sextus and Lucia play. And so I knew I was gonna have to learn about Roman toys. Um, that came from both primary and secondary sources. I read a lot of Hyginus, uh, who's a first century um, Roman myth writer because I knew which myths I wanted to read about. And so I went and I found the primary sources. Um, and then there are other questions like, what kind of boat would you take between Stabiae and Misenum? And what would it look like? Um, and those come up in the middle of writing, usually when you realize that you're going to have to get on a boat. Um, <laughs> it, is, it is okay to not realize all of those things and to, to have to go searching for those sources later, um, which is still where things like JSTOR come in. Um, museum websites have been really helpful. Um, I cannot recommend Adkins and Adkins' Handbook to Life in Ancient Rome highly enough. Uh, I also really recommend Cicerones Filius. It's a text in Latin that's like absurdly useful for daily life stuff. Um, I write books in which my characters do a lot of moving between cities, and so interactive maps are great. Uh, Orbis, which is in all caps, comes in handy about half the time, and the other half the time it teaches you how to teleport. Um, the digital <laughs> it does the digital atlas of the Roman Empire is a super fun tool uh, that you should not lose hours clicking around in um, just because you can. But um, if you have a mental image of what you're writing, that can really help guide your smaller questions. The brainstorming should lead to the bigger questions, and the smaller questions should come from mental image and and scenes that you're in the middle of when you realize I need a picture of this. This needs to be visible. Um, but I don't know what it looks like. <laughs> I also have to confess, I've spent um, many an hour clicking around on Orbis and trying to figure out how quickly or slowly you can get places. And when it works, um, it's amazing. We have spent a lot of time learning about how we research. So at this point, I think it's probably time to wrap up. Yeah. And next time, we will be talking about tricky words because they work differently in Latin and in English. Idiom, idiom is a tough thing to nail down. Um, but until then. Uh, Which doesn't just mean like, you know, it's raining cats and dogs. It can also mean like, here's what the word means. Totally. Yeah, absolutely. Um, idiom, idiom refers to a whole lot more than just phrases. Um, yes. But until then, uh, legite et scrivite bonis <laughs> Ah, uh, good day, Wally Otis. <laughs>